There are certain doors that should never be opened. Doors that lead to places you would never wish to go. Doors that, once opened, you cannot shut. I opened one such door. And there is not a minute, no, not a second, of my life that I don't wish I had not. Looking back to that night, I still have no idea what drove me to do it. It wasn't youthful exuberance. I had outgrown that. It wasn't desperation. I was uh, happily married with a child on the way. I think it may have been simply down to the two most dangerous words in the English language. What if? Or... Maybe it was just out of my control from the start. If Hannah hadn't been late, it would all have been different. I was due to meet her at the station and walk with her back here, over the fields. She had said she wanted me to hold her hand, make sure she didn't lose her footing, her being with the child and all. But between you and me, I think she was more scared of the things that go bump in the night, as she called them. I used to tease her about that, and it always made me laugh. How someone so smart, so confident and worldly-wise could be afraid of such things. I certainly don't laugh about that now. Anyway, her train was running late. Killing time, I wandered around the streets near the station and was attracted to one solitary light in the otherwise dark neighborhood. The light was coming from a bookstore, set back slightly from the sidewalk. The paint above the window cracked and was too faded to read. I pushed the door and went inside, and was greeted by the odor of cracked leather, aging parchment, and the hundreds, thousands of fingers that had poured over and turned the pages inside. A man, dressed curiously as if he had stepped out of one of the pages of the books himself, sat in a rocking chair in the corner, a black cat on his lap, and a black shapeless hat on his head. All four eyes watched my entrance, halting my step. I tried to smile and opened my mouth to say good evening, but no sound would come out, and the smile went no further than my initial thought. After two, three, maybe four seconds, where I found I could go no further into the shop, caught in the doorway, he doffed his hat, bade me welcome, and asked me to browse at my leisure. He said he was confident I'd find something that took my fancy. I had been in a half a mind to go straight back out, but partly out of politeness and partly due to me not wanting to be like, well, like Hannah, afraid of my own shadow, I went in and proceeded to absent-mindedly scan the shelves. Each one was crammed with books of all shapes, sizes, and colors many written in languages I had never seen before or since. I was about to turn around and leave, sure that Hannah would be here by now, wondering where I had got to, when my eyes fell on a book, slightly sticking out from its neighbors on the shelf. I can't say why I took any interest in it. It was, if anything, plainer than the others around it. Its cover was of a dark brown leather, with just the image of an eye, shaped rather like that of a cat on its spine. An image I saw was repeated on the front when I slid it from the shelf. I thought you would find something that caught your eye. The owner was behind me. Despite his age, he had left his chair and come up behind me without me being aware. Um, how much? I stammered. It's already yours. I don't want your money. He held my gaze for a couple of seconds. 
then turned around and went to the back of the shop, busying himself with a pile of books that lay on a small, round table. Like a fool, I stood there, not knowing what to do. Then, I saw Hannah through the window, her face framed by the scarf I had bought her just two weeks before, pressed against the window peering in. As if released from a spell, I put the book in my overcoat pocket and narrowly, avoiding kicking the cat which had moved between me and the door, left the shop, never being more happy to give my wife a hug. Ashamed and surprised in equal measures at the thumping in my chest. It was two weeks before I opened the book. Hannah had not been well all day and had gone to bed shortly after dinner. There was what had the markings of a storm outside, the wind rattling the windows in ever-increasing gusts, rain driving against the panes. I poured a glass of nice red wine, got the fire roaring in the grate, and settled down to see if the book could possibly be as strange as the place I'd bought it. To be honest, I'd kind of forgotten about the shop and the book. With your first child on the way, there are always a million and one things to do, and this was the first time I'd had an evening to do, well, nothing. I sat in my favorite armchair, the book on my lap. The eye on the cover was slightly raised, and it seemed to hold my gaze. No, more than that. To stare through me. To stare into me. I started to feel the same unnerving sensation I had experienced back in the shop, and found myself when I managed to look away from the eye, looking nervously around the, up until then, so familiar room. And oh, how I wish I'd thrown that book into the fire. How I wish that with every fiber of my body, every minute of every day. But I didn't. Instead, I opened the book. The old leather that bound the book was stiff with age, and it needed a little effort to open, creaking slightly. My first thought was that it was written in a language I did not understand, but then the words seemed to swim before my eyes, and I was able to read it. And I read it. Every word. After a while, I don't know how long. I realized I was reading aloud, something I hadn't done since junior school. I have no idea what I was reading. It was like some poem or words jumbling into other apparently random words, but I couldn't stop. They spilled out of me like blood from a severed artery, gushing from my mouth, filling the room around me. The wind and rain on the windows no longer sounded like that of a storm, but a people desperately clawing at the glass, not trying to get in, but to escape from something, from somewhere else. The shadows from the fire merged and danced on the walls, gyrating and fornicating figures, murderous and monstrous shapes. The wine in my glass was no longer a Merlot, but the thick, ruby-warm, cloying texture of blood. I woke the next morning. The fire was out, the book closed on my lap, the wine glass smashed on the floor by my slippered feet. Outside, the storm had died down just a slight breeze troubling the leaves that had been torn from their branches in the night. But there was something else. Five years before, I had carried my wife over the threshold of that house, our home. In two months' time, I had been looking forward to doing the same with our first child. The previous night, 
I had brought something else into the house. Our child was born two weeks later. Hannah felt it kicking, and to use her words, clawing at her in the early hours. I rushed downstairs to call for Dr. Howard, but I'd only got halfway down when my wife's screams made me run back into the bedroom. I was just in time to see the birth, if that's what you can call it. That child, that thing, crawled out of my wife, its mother. It sat on the end of the bed between Hannah's feet, hissing. Its small body covered in hair, matted from the blood and fluid from the birth. We both just stared at it as it hissed at us, then started to chew on the cord that had joined it to its mother. That was five years ago. I can now talk about that without breaking down. Well, what happened later, what we, or what I had to do, well, I can't talk about that. Not yet, maybe never. There is a small pile of stones next to the birch tree that marks the place we buried her. It. Hannah has a no less fitting but better grave in the churchyard. Her mind went first. It couldn't cope with what had happened, what was happening. After her mind broke, her body soon followed. Everything she ate, her body seemed to gain no goodness from it. When I carried her to her bed for the last time, she weighed no more than a pile of rags. I don't know why I have managed to carry on. <laughs> no, that's a lie. I know exactly why I've been allowed to carry on. I'm the carrier. I have the book. It is my role to pass it on, to give it to someone else, another body, a soul, for it to infect and destroy. For five years I have resisted, fought against it, despite the horrors that accompany me every day. The images that are there whenever I close my eyes, the voices, trickling, obscene, vengeful and hysterical thoughts, prophecies and threats into my ears. For five years, I have held on, but I am getting weaker. Once I was sure I would never subject anyone else to what I and my family have been through. That I would never pass it on. Would take the pain and endure the horrors and suffer the torment that I had brought upon myself. But now, I am not so sure.